Welcome back to Woke Nation. This is September 10th. It's about, well, it's after midnight now. Um, we were off uh, this past week. I've just been dealing with some health issues, and at the same time, we're looking for a new house, so things have just been crazy. Hard to keep up with because I'm also working 50 plus hours a week. Um, but anyway, uh, we're back in the uh, back in the saddle again, as they say. And this episode is a little bit more of a uh, a light touch. I'm gonna put aside all the politics and everything because, you know, sometimes you just gotta kick back and uh, not not dwell on things that are so stressful. Um, but what I wanted to, what was amusing to me is, has been um, has been Walmart and how it, it really is the one place that you can go to, and it, it literally is like a like a melting pot everybody ends up at walmart i mean you think that also maybe of mcdonald's but not so much anymore but and target's just you know a cheap um a cheap imitation of walmart but really walmart you will find anybody and everybody at walmart especially you find some really crazy unique people if you go there at say two three o'clock in the morning to one of those super walmarts that are open 24-7, you go to one of those places and you'll see some real freaks. You see some really crazy people. You really see the people that just don't come out when there's sunlight. Um, I mean, I've seen, I've seen uh, well, cross-dressers, uh, bikers, 500-pound you know, ex-Hell's -Hell, Angels riding around on those little carts, you know, with their bellies protruding out from... Uh, a leather outfit and all these upside down crosses dangling off of their uh their vests uh, with the old um satan slaves or hell's angels like uh lettering almost completely uh rubbed out rubbed off of the leather and they, but they still put it on and they they get out there and their chest is all bare and it's all hairy and and they have bigger uh breasts on them than than Pamela Anderson but they man they get out there and and what's ironic is well maybe it's they have no shame whatsoever in the stuff they buy either you know they'll just kind of me driving this little car down the aisle little kids get in their way they just run them right over you know you hear bones crunching as you know all that weight in the vehicle go right over a two-year-old they don't even blink and they just keep right on going and meanwhile left and right their arms their arms are always skinny though because they, they're always moving those things to pick up food you know the rest of their body never moves a single bit a single inch but their arms man like you know it's, they're like swimmers you know they just their arms are constantly flailing like octopus tentacles grabbing everything around them um, you know, you'll see them just sweep with one hand, um, six, seven packets of, uh, of, um, T-bones and steak and, uh, chicken breasts and, and bags and bags of, uh, French onion, uh, potato chips and barbecue potato chips, hers, anything. And then when they go in to actually pay for their food, I mean, God help whoever stacked up the candy aisle, because that whole thing goes into the basket as well. And the basket itself is so small, it's always overflowing with these people. Um, and it's uh, it, oftentimes you'll see these older he uh, Hell's Angel biker dudes who are, you know, riding around on those carts. You know, and the the their little basket is just completely overflowing. I mean, as they run over kids and crash into things, trying to get in their in their rabid zombie-like haste to to get more and more food. Um, you'll just see things like falling out of their basket and always behind them always behind them is either their mother or their their living girlfriend who's also their nurse and takes care of them and this lady will be you know nowhere near as big as they are but just still really big and and they'll be wearing nothing remotely in the same genre or or uh or group as a hell's angel you know somebody that 20 30 years ago this guy would have would have spit at or, or driven his motorcycle over and laughed about it later um and never would she have been permitted to be like a mama or something like that but she'll be wearing like um 
um, really loose hanging, and she's really big too, of course. Really loose hanging sweatpants with cigarette burn holes all over them. Um, usually like some kind of um, 1990s uh, white t-shirt uh, with like Sublime, some, some punk band from the 90s like Green Day or Sublime written across the front in faded lettering. Some of the lettering's already rubbed off from because she's worn the shirt for like five years straight and never washed it. Um, and and on top of that, I hate to say this, but they never wear a bra either. And they're big, so like they have these giant like boom, you know, right in your face, and it, it almost pokes your eye out. And you're six feet away from them, you know. And and so this lady will be following behind him while he's like, Dah! like more potato chips. And he's just throwing everything into the car and saying, You forgot your wallet again, Sam. Oh, shut up, woman, and give me potato chips. You know, that's, and that's how they are. Um, but it, that's what you find at Walmart, and that's why I love going there. Anytime we say we gotta go shopping, I always get real depressed when we gotta go to Giant, because nobody goes to Giant, at least nobody that I wanna see. I mean, who cares about the people at Giant? They're all normal. You know, uh, the giant near our house, like, you just get, like, these middle-class people that are in there, and, I mean, who cares about them? Who wants to see them? They're, they're nothing special. They're just like you and me. I mean, there's, uh, what's there to see? And then the other giant, which is about ten minutes farther away in Camp Hill, is all upper-middle-class people. They're all, you know, a lot wealthier than I am, so there's just this jealousy factor, and I want them all to crash their cars and you know, get mugged on the way home. Um, so I, I don't care about them either. No, you go to Walmart at like 2 or 3 in the morning and you get to see the real freaks, man. You get to see the underbelly of America, the people that really voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> I did too, so what am I talking about? Um, but there's a whole group of, you know, different people that you'll see there. Um... I mean, the first group you'll see is is what I call, uh, as I was talking about the the Hell's Angel, the hopelessly obese. Now, most of these people are middle aged. You don't see too many elderly people like this, mostly because obese people's hearts usually give out before sixty. But a big part of the hopelessly obese crowd is also part. They're part of the white trash subgroup. You'll see. As I was saying, like a, a 500 pound dude riding down the aisle on one of Walmart's little go-karts. And these go-karts have little baskets on the front, like I was saying. Um, and it, it ain't even going to hold a quarter of what this dude's trying to buy. And then you'll see this dude's mom, or his mama, his girlfriend, who's just a little bit smaller, but still grotesquely huge, pushing an overflowing shopping cart alongside of him. And even riding on this cart, the dude's like, he's out of breath when he talks. <sighs> them chips, mm, them chips over there. Them, them, blah, 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 blah. And everything in his cart is pure crap. Potato chips, onion rings, cup of noodles, ramen noodles, hot dogs, cheese curls. Anything that can be deep fried is in there. Not a single fruit or vegetable. And the dude's skin is pasty and dotted with pimples. It looks like the uh, the volcanic ring around uh, Hawaii. His hair swirled in every which direction. He's always wearing sweatpants with cigarette burn holes and stained with last week's meatloaf. Um, it, it's It's amazing. And these people vote too, you know. Another group you might spot is... is it's kind of it is the biker couple you know you you always see them and they they're usually late at night too because they never work you know and they their nights are their days usually their get up is leather and denim now the chick is almost always over tanned and you know with skin like cracked leather and the guy's the same way. He'll have, and usually he'll have an, an American bald eagle tattooed on his shoulder and be wearing cowboy boots. And you know he's been smoking the past 50 years because he'll laugh and hawk up bucketfuls of, of phlegm at the same time. And his lady's voice is just as deep as his. She'll have on probably cut off jeans, cut way too high up her thigh in an attempt to be sexy, but no one wants to look. And you can tell she used a cheap pair of scissors to to 
to turn the jeans that the shorts they used to be jeans you can tell like pants and she used some dull scissors to cut them down into shorts uh, because they're not even even you can tell and there's long strings just dangling and and dragging on the floor and usually she'll be wearing a shirt that advertises like Budweiser or Marlboro or it'll be so old that it has camel gel on the front of it something that's just not been around for the past 30 years which you know can be cool actually and the dude will have on like a Leonard Skinner shirt uh, and an American flag bandana. They, these guys are always bald and wearing bandanas. Um, they, and they do it on purpose, you know. I mean, it's like a prerequisite. You have to be bald if you're going to be a biker, dude. Um, and a question for all of it. How many of you have stood behind a couple like this? especially in the checkout line and they just start like engaging in PDA and it's usually some long drawn out kiss like two wrinkled withered lips locked in onto each other like unneeded dough and you know do you notice how these people all have the same sense of humor yeah if you run into bikers they all joke about the same stuff it always revolves around girls they hooked up with when they were younger and drinking I'm telling you, every biker was or is a Don Juan. These guys have gotten laid more than Casanova, at least in their minds. And they're always telling you, man, when I was younger, I was getting it in. I would crack, get up, crack a beer, smoke a cigarette, and head out on the town all day. Used to drink all day and all night. Coming home with a different girl every other night. And I lived like that for 30 years. But I can't do that no more. A lot of fun, though. Well, I can't do it no more. And there's always a very deep twinge of sadness at the end of that speech. Um, the glories of a, of a misspent youth. And it's like a spiel they all memorize, and it's passed down through the white trash DNA from one derelict to another. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Walmart is America's promised land. It is the ultimate melting pot. It's a liberal's wet dream. No kidding. Everyone goes to Walmart. Like I said, everyone. You get the Section 8 crowd, the food stamp crowd, the illegal immigrants, legal immigrants, gangster wannabes, middle America soccer moms, wealthy um, suit and tie flakes, bikers, tourists, everybody. Everybody passes through Walmart. Um, you also get the immigrant crowd, like I was saying. Um, now, I'm not going to get into the whole illegal and legal debate with this. That's for another podcast and another time, but this is all humor here. Ha <laughs> ha. But there's always a huge Mexican family in the aisles at Walmart. You get the young, sorrowful mother who's pregnant and pushing the cart. Around her will be, you know, six or seven kids all waving items in her face, hoping she'll let them buy it. And usually, you'll see this nine times out of ten, it's always the pregnant mother that's pushing the cart. And usually her husband is there, kind of moping around. I've noticed these guys are quiet and very reserved. Like, the mother's very boisterous, and if you, and she'll make eye contact with you. If you bump into them or something, she'll smile and joke around and nod. And the husband won't even look at you. Like, he kind of looks at his feet and just... <laughs> you know, he won't talk. He, and, and he doesn't ever push the cart for his pregnant wife, ever. I've seen this so many times. They just, like, kind of mope around and, like, yell a few things at the kids. But, you know, heaven forbid you push the cart for your wife who's about to pop out your 13th child. Um, and... If you, I don't know, 7-Elevens, now this is a little bit, you know, I'm talking about 7-Eleven instead of Walmart, but one thing I've noticed that I think is hilarious about, because this involves the immigrant crowd, um, if you've ever been in a 7-Eleven, and that isn't as strange a question as you might think, because they are disappearing fast, and depending on who listens to this podcast, if you're very young, you may not have been in a 7-Eleven. Walmarts, well not Walmarts, but Wawa's are taking them off the map. Sheets, um, Turkey Hills, uh, etc. are getting rid of 7-Elevens. Uh, pretty soon, there was one right down the street from me. It's gone now, and it's been empty for the past six months to a year. Um, 
they're not coming back. They're disappearing so fast, so it's not a rhetorical question. But you ever notice how it, uh, in every 7-Eleven you go into, there there used to just be a mop bucket sitting there. And the mop bucket would be full of just dirty water. And I saw this in almost every 7-Eleven I went into. There would just be a mop bucket always in, in in the middle of the store, usually you in line of sight when you walk in the doors, uh, with the mop pushed down inside of it, and the water would just be black with filth and crap. And usually they'd have a rag on the counter by the coffee machine too, but it would be a real tattered, dirty, filthy rag. Um, and they always seemed so they always seem like they're cleaning you know there'd be a spray bottle and maybe a roll of paper towels but the 7-elevens despite all that were the most filthy places i have ever been in i have never been in a more decrepit um facility or or building uh, establishment than a uh, than a 7-eleven I mean, so many of them, the ceiling tiles are, are sagging down because there's leaks in the roof. You know, they're yellowed with, with water stains. Um, and the floor is just grimy and dirty. It's it's stuffy and sweaty inside the place. Um, nobody can speak English. Not that that makes it dirty, but I'm just it just adds to the decorum, uh, to the general uh, clean atmosphere. Eh. But yeah, just I always thought it was so funny how they had a mop bucket always sitting there, and yet the place is just decrepit. Um, always a mop bucket and a rag, but yet the filthiest place on the face of the planet. Well, maybe not. Baghdad's probably worse, but you know, or or Haiti, as Trump says, Tahiti. No, Tahiti's nice. Never mind. What am I talking about? Um, there's also uh, another group. It's the uh, there's and it's a it's a rare species that also inhabits the Walmart ecosystem. This one isn't endangered, but still extremely elusive, and I call it the rich fish. And this rare specimen usually uses stealth to procure the merchandise he or she desires, and it's hilarious to watch the interactions between other patrons and the rich fish, or rich bachelor, however you want to say it. Um, see, the uh, the rich bachelor has an assumed air of superiority about him or her, or bachelorette. Uh, check it out sometime. This character has a feigned air of manners and propriety. So when bumping into, say, the immigrant group or the biker couple, he's got this really tight smile stretched across his face. And it's so obvious he's uncomfortable. His body goes rigid like a surfboard, but he's never able to express it through words. He's so polite, it's painful. Brutal honesty isn't an ingrained character trait, but his entire body language says he's desperate to escape. These rich guys usually leave half the store gagging in the aisles. They wear cologne like someone dunked them in a bottle of Drakkar. There is no subtlety with them. And come on, gold watches are so tacky nowadays. You know, Mexican guys wear a horrific amount of cologne, too. Except they wear some cheap stuff, like Axe body sprays. I mean, I wear it, too, but I'll maybe spray myself up and down once, if that. But if you walk past a group of, of especially young Mexican guys, and just one of these rich white bachelors in a Walmart aisle, and it's all factory warfare. No surrender, no prisoners. But these these uh, these rich uh, like banker dudes like it, it is really funny just to see them interact with these other people like there's just this incredible social social awkwardness about them that they, they are rigid as a board you know and their body actually kind of goes rigid and then leans backwards like the Leaning Tower of Pisa away from whoever it is that they're speaking to. Almost as if if they breathe the same air, they might suffocate suddenly and die. I mean, it, 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 like ordinary people are repellent, like like they're the opposite part of a magnet. They're just being pushed away, um, and and they use as few words as possible, but yet they're overly polite. It's like this this excessive need to be polite, and and in in their world, that's like saying get away from me, being 
but but to somebody like an immigrant or or a normal person like me uh, it actually is an invitation like this person's being polite oh they like me they want to talk to me yet in their mind they're they're trying to push you away and so uh, you have two opposite um ideas for what's actually going on here and the situation just gets worse and worse and worse because it, it continues one person thinks that this other guy wants to engage in conversation and this guy wants desperately to escape but he doesn't know how to say it he doesn't even know how to say politely i gotta go and so it just becomes even more awkward meanwhile i'm standing there laughing I, it really is great and you do see these kind of things at two or three o'clock in the morning trust me um another group and this is um one of the worst out of all of them one of the most horrific offenders um, to human eyesight it's the pajama thong girl and this is usually characterized by white trailer park fauna uh, you'll be standing in line um, for the next self checkout booth desperately trying to breathe clean air after you run in with the rich white bachelor and his Mexican opponents and there there right in front of you is something that would blind any man you get this anorexic stick figure with hair that more resemble, resembles straw than hair, bending over to pry a half-eaten bag of Doritos out of her two-year-old's grubby fingers. She has a tattoo with a name like Manuel etched onto her wrist with a date like 8-7-2013 to let everyone know her baby daddy was shot on August 7, 2013. But the real horror is that she's wearing a skin-tight white shirt with some 90s band inscribed across the chest, presumably to, to uh, bring attention to the fact that she didn't wear a bra. And the shirt is too short uh, to meet the top of her pajama bottoms, so we all get a perfect view of the wrinkled volcano crater that is her belly button after she's, after she's pushed out 16 kids. And then, yes, the pajama bottoms. They're always either The Simpsons or South Park or Beavis and Butthead. Something like that. Some dated cartoon from the 90s that was definitely rated M.A. and was on one time considered edgy and controversial, but is now passe and just accepted by the general establishment. Um... And of course, as she bends down for the Doritos to take them away from her grubby child, her thong rides way up. And I'm not trying to be intentionally crude either. I'm really not. This is purely, simply observational. But I mean, if your thong is riding that high, it's gotta hurt. It just has to. I've never worn one, but that's my assumption. But... In these situations, it's never lingerie, you know, something classy, um, something somebody might wear um, it, only in the bedroom and maybe just had on uh, because they were running out the door, but you would try to kind of cover it and not let everybody see it. It's never something like that. It's always something glittery and fa flashy, like a uh, truck stop stripper would wear, you know? Something that only the most gaudy, like, like look at me, attention craving um, charlatan would wear, and that, and that's always what it is. It's never something subtle. It's just like this thing that just like gouges out your eyeballs and makes you want to just run out into uh, six lanes of traffic um, just to erase the image. You know, only a car accident could save you from something like that. Um, um, but continuing, so there you are at checkout, your sense of smell is raped, your eyeballs bleeding, you just want to pay and get out. You wonder why you keep coming back to Walmart, but still every weekend you're here along with the rest of America. Come on, you've rung everything up, but then no. And uh, how many people have been in this situation where you just want to get out of there, but then that yellow warning signal flashes across the screen. And you jab at the monitor, hoping the machine will sense your frantic need to escape and suddenly start working. But no, that never happens. And of course there's no attendant. Never. So you start looking around, frantically. And uh-oh, you see... Um, nothing. 
nothing at all. No matter how far you look, no matter how many times you turn your head, 180, 360, it doesn't matter. You pull a Linda Blair and you spin around, it, uh, it doesn't matter. But finally, finally, uh, after what seems like an eternity, um, there's the attendant. And it's, it's sad how relieved you are to see him because there's absolutely nothing about him that should inspire confidence. Yes, this pimpled, white, scrawny kid is the cream of the crop. Usually he has a lazy eye. His eyebrow is actually his eyebrows is a, are actually an eyebrow. It's a unibrow. Um and it's so bushy and hairy you suspect Bigfoot is lying sideways across his forehead. And what a forehead it is. It's a five head more like. It is a high sloping ball of emptiness. And it's so big that Trump could balance the national budget on it. But this kid's leaned up against an unused cast register, half asleep. And finally, he sees you and stumbles over. He leans in and swipes his badge over the scanner. And as he does it, five weeks worth of sweat and B.O. donkey punches you in the nose. He keeps uh, swiping his badge because the first time never works. Of course it wouldn't with all that odor. Um, and finally, he finally gets you through. You hurriedly grab your stuff and head straight for the door. Before you get to the door, you run smack into a homeless man who works for the Salvation Army, um, ringing his little bell. That, I think, is probably the only good redeeming thing about the whole experience. Because then you get to give a little of yourself to something actually worthwhile, instead of just a corporate machine which is strangling out all the private businesses, which is all Walmart really represents. Um, but yeah, if you don't go to Walmart on a regular basis, you probably haven't seen a lot of the things I have in this world. Um, I've been scarred, I can tell you that. If you go to Target, you probably won't see 90% of what I just described, because Target, Target doesn't seem to attract all the same people. I don't know what it is about Target, but it just seems, uh, I don't know. I went to Target today, actually. Uh, to pick up the new uh, Eminem CD. It was that surprise comeback uh, CD. It's called Kamikaze that he just came out with after it's kind of a rebuttal uh, to his critics from his last album, Revival, which was an absolute mess. There was only two songs on the entire Revival album that were worth anything. And actually the one, I think it was called White Boy, um... It had a catchy beat to it, and I actually liked the music, but the lyrics were stupid. And, you know, it's just typical, um, just typical PC trash, really. You know, that white people are overprivileged, and, you know, because uh, that even in America in 2017, it's white people keeping black people down, basically. I don't understand why he would he would make a song like that besides just trying to fit in, which is the last thing that Eminem should try to do. But I mean, he he was the one that used to used to go on and on about how he was the victim of prejudice because he was a lone white man coming up in a in black culture and black neighborhoods and black dominated um, uh, rap battles and and rap clubs, and, um, and, and he talked often about how, because he was only, he was the only white guy coming up doing this stuff, that for years he dealt with, uh, prejudice and, and, and basically race hate, um, uh, and people judging him by his race saying he could never succeed, well, he's, he's become the, the best-selling rapper of all time. But growing up, he dealt with a lot of that, and he, he's been very candid about that over the years. So it's it's kind of surprising to hear him kind of do a little bit of an about-face and sing about how white people are all the problem now. The song, like I said, is catchy, but the lyrics are just absolutely ridiculous. And the other one, I, I mean, they're all so forgettable, I can't even... There's something about me, I think it was called Framed. It was like the 12th song on it. Um... And it, it it was catchy, but, I mean, again, nothing memorable on it. That old, like, fire that he used to have on albums like The Eminem Show and The Marshall Mathers and The Slim Shady LP, which I actually just bought again. The Slim, I, I lost my original copy of it. 
with some, you know a song like my name is and um um some of the other ones especially the Eminem show which was by far uh his best album and people don't give him credit enough credit for being a social uh satirist um some of the songs on the the Eminem album are really like sharp with pointing out the hypocrisies in America um I don't I don't support certainly a lot of the stuff he he raps about um although I think it, it I think it's very ironic that somebody who was celebrated when he first came out like Eminem because he pushed boundaries with the uh with his with his language and how offensive he was and uh, sing it, rapping about um, killing Kim, you know, and uh, her body's in his trunk and he's going to chainsaw this person and do, you know, dissing this person, dissing that with really abusive, harsh language. Um, but he was embraced by a lot of the liberal media and sort of and celebrated and championed, you know, his free speech and, you know, this great uh, artist and all this. And now those same figures in a lot of ways are turning against him uh, because he's used the word faggot on on the album Kamikaze. And it, he uses it in reference to, I guess, a, a rapper named uh, or hip-hop artist named Taylor the Creation, who I've never heard of in my life. I, ironically, well, if you, it's it, a lot of this criticism um, is hypocritical and stupid and lazy minded and and it's clear that the people it took me 5 minutes to b reading articles online to really figure out um the reality of what's going on and that's that um his use of the word faggot is is only in in reference um not directly to Taylor the creator um but to the fact that Taylor the creator on his albums um uses the word himself the word faggot and uses it intentionally to to uh to suggest that he himself might be gay or or bisexual at the least and so he uses a slur to to potentially describe himself and that's all Eminem uses it for um just to um call attention to that basically and do it in a funny way but I mean, I don't. I don't support calling somebody that. I don't support you know the N word or any or any terms like that. But I think it's absurd that, um, that people try to rub those things out, and it's scary, uh, especially to see a figure that ten years ago was championed for his bold use of language and and how offensive he is. Um, now those same people turning against him and. And saying, you know, enough's enough. You know, he needs to, he needs to be uh, um, challenged for all this, and and brought to, uh, you know, some form of justice. You know, some people are saying that. You know, there was an article in the Advocate that was kind of brutal, um, which is unsurprising. It's a gay magazine, but I mean, whatever happened to just just not buying somebody's CD if you don't like what they're saying. Like, this whole PC thing has just gotten so far out of hand with trying to purge anything that they might deem offensive from from the society, from society, from, from the arts, from, from language, from every... Uh, every atmosphere out there. They just want to purge it completely. Um, they they want to purge it from our history. They want to change history so that the more offensive parts of American history just simply aren't there. You know, pulling down statues so that these people are forgotten about. They say it's so that we don't celebrate them, but nobody's saying that because there's a statue in somebody's town necessarily that you're worshipping it or celebrating it. If that person was a big part of the history of your town... Um, it would all depend on, on what they did wrong, number one, you know, like a statue of Robert E. Lee. There was a lot more to Robert E. Lee than the fact that he fought in this, that, well, not that he fought in this, but that, but that the South owned slaves at the time. 
you know, they blatantly ignore the actual reality of the situation, which was that only six to nine percent of Southern uh, people actually owned slaves. It was, without question, a dying industry. Um, and Robert E. Lee never fought the Civil War because he wanted to uphold slavery, or he he was not fighting for to keep his slaves. He was fighting for the idea that you should stand up for your family and and your state, which is your homeland. Number one, um, people often forget that a long time, not so long ago, but it feels like forever ago, that this country was founded on the idea that these states were in a lot of ways separate entities. Yes, they were united under a federal government, but that federal government was supposed to be largely hands off from how they operated and what how they decided to live. And so if they found themselves in conflict with said federal government, it should not be sedition and treason um to uh to wanna opt out, to succeed to secede. Um and I mean that's a lot of people twist that to be treasonous today, but I don't think so. And I think given the context of uh, states' rights, especially, that was especially strong at the time in the 1860s and previous to that, no, I don't, I don't think it's treasonous at all. I think it's a power move uh, by the federal government to start a civil war over it, more like. Um, but uh, I'm getting off track. It's just this, this overreaching um, policing of language um, by the PC culture, and this this whole thing with Eminem, uh, with his Kamikaze album, is just another part of it, you know, with his use of the word faggot. You know, so what? Don't buy the CD then. If you're gay and it offends you, you know, pick it out front of his house. Pick it in front of Walmart. I, I don't know, but, I mean, really? Come on, at the end of the day, who cares? You know, I'm a Christian. I believe a lot of... Um, but a, a lot of uh, what goes on on, in, on TV blatantly offends the Christian religion. It's, it's blasphemous, it's, it's profane, uh, it mocks Jesus Christ. I mean, South Park does, Family Guy does, um, and, and on a regular basis. And what am I going to do? I change the channel. I don't watch it. I don't support it. I don't enjoy it. Um, but you can't ban it and you can't purge it from society and I can't tell somebody that they can't watch that. The biggest thing for me with all that was um, when I really realized that like I have to believe this for everybody, that everybody has the right to be offensive, was uh, with Charlie Hebdo, um, the, uh, the French uh, satirical magazine that was shot up by the Muslims in 2015, the Jihadis I should say. Um, but they were, they were shot up because they, they drew pictures of Muhammad. And, you know, of course I'm like, well, of course they, uh, you know, I was all out there saying they have the right to do this, etc. Nobody should shoot them for it. Um, and then one day I happened across another one of their cartoons online, which was extremely blasphemous in the context of the Christian religion. And it depicted the Trinity, and it, and it was just in a very vulgar, disgusting manner. Um, and it really, uh, I'm not going to lie, it really shocked me. And it really like threw me through a loop. And it actually was so disturbing to me that it, it took me a day or two to really, like, like I felt weird for a, a day or two after that, because it was just so, like, offensive to what I believe. And, and uh, but... That's when I realized, like, even that, even though I hate it and I think it's disgusting, I still have to, even that, I have to support their right for them to do that. Because it is not, you know, it is not up to the laws of man to decide who can say what, where, and when. We will all stand before uh, God in the end and have to give an account for every thought, word, and deed. Um... And that will happen after we die at the judgment seat of God, not here on earth. And no man should uh, try to put themselves in that position as the judge. And that's what these PC people are trying to do, put themselves, who are hypocritical to say the least, 
um, as that the arbiters of what we can and cannot say here on in America. Um, it will not last, uh, and you're seeing the fruits of it here uh, with Eminem with his new album Kamikaze as they unilaterally turn on those that they not too long ago were just embracing. And you'll see this more and more. Um, as as heroes of the liberal left, uh, their old tweets are dug up like James Gunn and others. Uh, you'll see that more and more as, as the uh, PC crowd and the millennials um, who are in it become more and more hysteric, uh, hysterical, and rabid in their in their um, in their devotion to their supposed moral cause. Uh, you'll see it, you will see it more and more. You'll see more and more of the uh, the heroes of the old left uh, brought out and their heads placed on the chopping block uh, because it's a, it's a movement that doesn't respect even even its own. Uh, uh, even its own leaders, you know, it's a piranha shark mentality that just feeds off of itself. It cannot last. But that's it. That's all for the show for tonight. Uh, there will be another one next week. Um, no matter what, I am past uh, my health issues, at least for the time being. And God willing, we will be into a new house here shortly. But yes. There will be another episode next weekend uh, with a title and topic still to be determined, but be sure to listen in. You can subscribe to Woke Nation on iTunes for free, also to our YouTube, YouTube channel, and also download the Podbean app, and you can listen to it directly on podbean.com. Um, there's also a Woke Nation Facebook page that you can like and follow. Um, please leave a review also. If you have enjoyed this episode or any others on iTunes, as it gives uh, any podcast with the more reviews you get, the greater your reach on iTunes. Okay. All right. That's all for tonight. Good night and God be with you.